Welcome to the Modern Mythos Podcast, show dedicated to Call of Cthulhu and other investigative horror games. I'm John Hook. And I'm Seth Skorkowski, and together we'll be discussing writing, game mastering, and player tips, and how you can apply them to your table. Today's episode, we're talking about using investigator organizations and optional uses for your investigator's characteristics. Yeah, uh, so let's start with the uh, characteristics, optional uses for characteristics. Uh, so, Seth, in the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game, as you are creating your character, you know, of course, we've talked about this before, it's a skill-based system. And interesting enough, um, the character sheet, and it's noted right there, only two skills are actually gauged by your characteristics. Your own language is equal to your education score, your EDU score. And your dodge is equal to half of your dexterity score. That's it. If I was going to have any complaint about 70 Call of Cthulhu, because I consider it the most elegant game I've ever played. Uh, I, obviously, I'm a huge fan of it. Uh, it is the, the lack of skills or, or lack of stats being applied to skills. A lot of the other skill-based games that I'm used to that's just something that they did, whether it be uh, Alien or Traveler or Cyberpunk. It's like stat plus skill is is what you use at, as your base. Now, yep. uh, the BRP system where we've got that skill 1 to 100, there's not a adding a stat to a skill. But you know, we get our skill points for character creation. It's like 2 times your EDU plus 2 times... A, a different stat, which could also be EDU or it could be strength or dex or, or something like that. And then we get uh, two times your intelligence for your special interest. So it, it just, it, they dictate, you know, two or three stats dictate how many skill points you get total. But then after that, they really don't have any uh, relevance. Okay, we well, do get yeah. your, your hit points, your BOD your move, that stuff comes from, but not towards skills. Uh, yeah. And it's always bothered me, like, if you've got a character that's, like, super attractive, right? They're, like, got an 85 attractive, and they're like, well, I want to try to charm them. And, like, do I get any bonus because I'm, like, super model pretty, you know? And and, and that's one of those areas that's kind of about attractiveness or the appearance is one that I always feel kind of like gets neglected uh, in just about any role-playing game. I uh, totally agree. So, you know, in, in a lot of games, it kind of becomes like the dump stat because it is like the less least actual relevant for your character kicking butt. So, you know, that's why a lot of D and D groups are like a bunch of non-charismatic trolls, but yep. have like high strength. And uh, yeah, so uh, but yeah, if I was ever, if I was going to say I had any complaint about the system uh, mechanics, that would, that would, that would be it. And it, not, not, it's not a big one, but it's just one of those areas that I'm like, I feel I, I would like a little bit more uh, yep. of. I totally agree. You know, uh, so one of the reasons why I suggested uh, this topic is because I feel exactly the same way. You know, we, we, you spend all this time uh, rolling these stats and, and for seventh edition, you're, you're expanding them out, right? So you not only roll and figure out your primary stat, but you're also doing the half and the fifth values for them. And, you know, maybe there might come up something and, and the, the keeper might ask you to maybe make a strength roll to try and lift something or, you know, uh, Part of the chase rules, I will say this, part of the chase rules, if it's a foot chase, you are going to be making dex rolls, right? I mean, so yeah. that kind of comes into play. But, yeah, there aren't, I mean, it's a skill-based game, and there aren't a lot of skills that are that are leveraging uh, the, the characteristics. And because the character sheet has two that are noted, that got me thinking, I was like, what are some of the other skills that could leverage characteristics? But I didn't want to try and like over engineer it. I mean, you know, I want uh, to lean in and use the skill based system for what it's, you know, really well engineered for. But 
there are, I think I agree, there are ways that we can take the characteristics and apply some of them in certain instances. And, and so we've got a few that we wanted to talk about. Well, as you kind of noted already, um, your appearance. Your appearance is, I think, a very overlooked stat. And really, appearance could have amazing applications to the social skills. Uh, the, the game identifies that there are four social skills, charm, mm -hmm. fast talk, intimidate, and persuade. Uh, and I think you could really bring your app score into this. One thing that you might think about, keepers might consider uh, using it as an optional rule, is you could change the base chance of charm Instead of it being, I think it's like 20%, instead of it being that, make it sort of like Dodge. Make it half of your of your app score, right? Oh, current current is 15. That's right. It's not yeah, 20. Yeah, current's 15. Um, so my only thought with half, so uh, if you consider like uh, the average stat for, for most of them that you do just the 3D6 roll uh, should be 50, you know, as you're your average app based off your 3d6 times uh, five, I think should be 50. So if it was half of that, it would, it would bring that up to 25 versus the 15. So uh, I might do divide it by three or uh, something to that effect, or, you know, maybe twice what your, your, uh, your base is or, you know, the uh, extreme value. Uh, it's just something because I, I would like it on an average character. If you're at that, you know, 45 to 55, like that perfect bell curve, you know, center, that you're around 15%. And then if you are abnormally beautiful, it your base is just going to be higher. And then you add, you add all your skill points to everything like normal. You're just a little bit better at it. Or if you're just a hideous troll, uh, then it's it's a little bit harder because it's kind of hard to charm people when you're just ugly. So I that might be another way of doing it. Now a, a, another way, and this is one that I've I've considered uh, before, is if you uh, used bonus dice for it. I had uh, so if uh, for appearance. If you used for three of those interpersonal skills for uh, for charm, for fast talk, and persuade, uh, but not intimidate, we'll get to that shortly. Uh, if your app is seventy or higher, which is very, very damn pretty, I think that's uh, really high. Uh, is that a sixteen-year-old? Fourteen. Yeah, um, My math is failing. Yeah, fourteen. 14. 14. So if you're old 3D6, you got a, a you know a 14 or higher, you got a 70 app and you're pretty, have it to where it, it gives you the bonus die uh if you're trying to fast talk charm persuade. Because you're just you're so pretty, you just have a natural bonus. But then if your app is uh ridiculous, like you're at 90, you know, meaning you're old and 18, you might make it a second bonus die. You're at that, you know. Hollywood beautiful of, you know, like unlike mortal men. But then at the flip side, if you're pretty ugly and, and you drop it to where your app is 30 or less, that's a penalty die because you're just, it's just hard to convince somebody or persuade somebody when they're looking at your face and wondering if they should squash you. <laughs> uh, and, and then, you know, once again, if you get down to like or 10, which means you had to have had damage because you can't even start that low well uh, old old characters old, old characters have a reduction in their app or if you if you took a uh, a serious wound at some point in sure. your investigative career you got set on fire or had yeah. some creature because uh, you stuck your head in the attic and edge of darkness and and that thing tried to claw your face <laughs> off um, as might have happened to one of our characters uh then it's it all comes off of their their attractiveness because they're they've been mauled. So if you if you get to that point where you're just hideous, uh, then it could be a second penalty dice because it's it's even harder to persuade anybody because they're busy looking at you going, yeah, good 
God. Yeah. <laughs> I do. I do like that. I do like that. You know, and, and I, and you know, going, I hear what you were saying about the, uh, about the base, maybe be like one third uh, of, of the starting app. My only caveat to that is because the game is already engineered for uh, full half and fifth percentages to lean in and, and continue to utilize that, which is, which is what, deck you know the dodge skill does that right so yeah. it's half a dex and so that's the only reason why i was thinking a half half well, app would sense, be a good base yeah you know, if, you, if you did your characteristics first and you fill all that stuff in and when you get now dodge you've already calculated what half of your dex is it's it's yeah. noted right there at the top already of the there. sheet uh you don't have to bust out the calculator or your but, fingers <laughs> so saying so so if your attractiveness is real high it helps these three uh, interpersonal ones. But what about intimidate? Intimidate. So I say we do that um, where it's it's the inverse. So if you are huge, or, or sorry, if you are uh, if you're um, just absolutely ugly, that is going to give you uh, a, a, a bonus to intimidate because you're just this hideous troll. So if your attract if your attractiveness is thirty or less. It, it gives you a bonus. But if your attractiveness is 70 or more, where you're just so pretty, it suddenly actually is a penalty against intimidation for you because you're, you're it's harder to take you as, as intimidating because you're a lovely person. It's hard to believe that you are truly that threatening. But then the compliment would be size works kind of the same way towards intimidate. So if you're, once again, 70 or more, you get a bonus die because you're huge and hulking and, and you're probably looming over the person you're talking to. These people that, that are that are large can be naturally intimidating with whether they mean to be or not, just because people feel intimidated around someone that's that's taller than them. And then if you hit that 90 mark where you're just like a pro basketball player or something in size, it's this double bonus. You're just monstrous and towering above them. And then, of course, the inverse. 30 or lower, it's a penalty die because now you're that little twerp trying to get in someone's face and be intimidated. They're kind of like, oh, that's cute. <laughs> you have <laughs> short man syndrome. <laughs> so I, I think that would be kind of a cool way. My only problem with that is a way of noting that on the character sheet because I like the way Dodge works, it's just your base. And then you never think about it again because then you add points to your dodge and it's never anything you have to think about uh, because you do the math once and you're done. This is something you would still have to note next to those skills, whether you have a natural bonus or penalty on, on certain skills. You know, no skill on the character sheet, uh, whether it's a combat skill or any other kind of skill, has the mechanic for annotating bonuses of any sort. I mean, that is up for the keeper and the players, you know, to, to be cognizant of and to, to bring that up, you know, uh, if you were to implement uh, these uh, optional rules for the, uh, for these social skills, I would think players who are invested in their characters, they would, they would just remember that, right? I mean, if you told them at the beginning of the session, you know, especially during character creation, and you you invested a lot of points in intimidate because you feel like your character is kind of like a bouncer or a a, a mob hitman or something, right? And uh, and you really you really want to play that part, um, you remember that, so that when it comes time for your character to intimidate someone you're gonna say to your keeper hey remember i i've got a giant size and uh i've got that scar running down my face so my app is 30 and my size is 75 i've got, uh, I've got two bonus dice i got two bonus dice isn't that right and then the keeper will go that is correct so roll your intimidate with two bonus dice i mean they'll remember that Man, you've got a lot more faith in your players than than, than, <laughs> than, than than I do. These are some of my very closest to dearest friends. I would actually probably just have them mark a, literally like a plus or a minus next to that skill description. And if you have double bonus because you are huge and hideous, then you put two plus marks 
beside it or, or two minuses, maybe circle, some way that they can remember it. I would still want them to mark on their sheet uh, because it's their job to remember that. If I remember that for them, that's because they're lucky, but I want them to have that like right there uh, so they don't forget. Because sometimes uh, while we're sitting around before a game, we can chat about it and they can remember it. But for some reason, once the game starts, those things seem to just completely vacate their their mind. And I don't even know if putting on the character sheet would help them, but I, I at least try to problem solve of ways that I can look at them later on. Going, How did you forget? It's right there on your character sheet. <laughs> so... And we are, you know, as we hypothesize this, we are making the assumption that the scenario is the, the, the investigator is face to face with the person that they're trying to intimidate. But what about if you were trying to do an intimidation over the phone? right? You're on no. the phone. I would, as a keeper, I would adjudicate that any of these natural bonuses that you're going to get because you're ugly and, and big are gone. And that you using your voice only is just the intimidate skill itself. And not only that, I might say that you have to have a hard success on your role in order to, to, to do an intimidate over the telephone. So there are, there, it's situational. It's situational. And that's actually a, a really good point because uh, why you probably would be better to do bonus and penalty dice rather than your start uh, uh, skill pool or, or percentage because you're right, it could be done over the phone, especially uh, more common if we're doing modern games mm -hmm. versus just the 1920s because you know as we get you know further and further along and you know PCs are going to be busting out their cell phones. Uh, as as a thing, then then definitely uh, I do remember uh, one adventure, uh, Dark uh, Oh Bad Moon Rising, where there is an option it gave in there of sweet talking the operator to give you some information that they uh, that the PCs might want as as an option, and so that would be a completely they don't know what you look like over the phone in, in the 1920s situation. It was real weird as I remember reading that first time and I thought like, you know, that would have never crossed my mind ever that you could just call the operator and be all like, Hey, you know, can you help me out? Uh, just cause I don't, I've never called an operator on <laughs> like they used to have the switchboard operator. Right. So. Yeah, exactly. That's way before our times. Hey, we're old men. Uh, yeah. So uh, situational, you know, I, bonus dice, penalty dice, I think they're always just situational. And, and uh, dang, nubbit, you know, the players have to own some of this. So I would put it on them. Oh, well, oh, I, you forgot. I'm so sorry. Well, we're not going to go back and retcon that role. You just forgot to apply your bonus dice. <laughs> I, I think it gives them a good motivation to put stuff into appearance. Because, Absolutely. Uh, in our games, those interpersonal skills become uh, extremely valuable, uh, where they they really do focus on that. And, you know, they've basically kind of divided out of, like, I'm the charming one. I'm the liar. Yeah, I'm the persuasive one. Yeah. Oh, and... psychology or not psychology? Well, including psychology, but interpersonal social skills have always. I mean, it's been a hallmark uh, of of important skills for investigators to have in a Call of Cthulhu game because I, you are going to uh, attract more flies with honey, right? So oh, yeah. you're going to want to talk to the NPCs and, and, you know, see if you can get that information from them, collect those clues and, you know, continue on with the investigation. So it, you need them to be able to talk, you know, you can't, you know, bludgeon them all into submission uh, and knock them all out. One, one of the tricks that I've, I, I, I learned with interpersonal skills in, uh, especially Call of Cthulhu, because you've got the four, um, and you probably know this because you've been playing this longer than me, but uh, for our listeners that might not, uh, I don't let them say, I want to roll a charm or I want to roll a persuade. Uh, I ask them what they say and how they say it. And then I tell them as the keeper, what skill that falls under, because there's been so many times they're like, I want to try to charm them. And then they get in their face and they kind of threaten them. It's like, 
that's an intimidate, sir. And they're like, but my intimidate sucks. Like, well, you probably shouldn't have gotten in their face and threatened them <laughs> as, as, your, as your way of doing it. So, uh, so they actually have to kind of role play. How, what, you know, what would my character say? I might not say it as well as them, but to you kind of do it where it can encourage me to say, yeah, that's a charm or yeah, it's a fast talk or yeah, that's intimidate instead of them just declaring uh, what they say and then what skill they want to use for it. Cause you know, it, it, it has actually really helped us a lot by doing it that way, as far as they role play what they want to say. And then I dictate what skill that means. Yep. I, I totally agree. That is, uh, that's something that I've, I've done in the past. You know, the players are like, I want to talk to them and see if I can convince. Well, well, how do you do it? I just want to kind of get a sense on what, it, you know, maybe the player doesn't have the exact uh, words that they want to say, but I just want to get a sense of what is their approach. And, and usually it falls into those two camps of, of uh, intimidation versus charm. Um, fast talk is funny because it, it really is that uh, uh, confusion. You're trying to confuse your target with just blathering, you know, and sometimes um that'll work. Or sometimes you might want to just like, I want to confuse the, the bouncer by just saying a bunch of stuff and getting to, to get, be confused that I'm actually part of the party that's already been let in. And, you know, that's the kind of thing, you know, with fast talk. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of lies on the fly. Lies on the fly. Yeah. And what's funny is, you know, it's not really considered one of the, the core social skills, but psychology is excellent uh, as a as almost like a defensive social skill because we use psychology for uh, reading people. You know, yeah. was that NPC being uh, truthful? You know, are they lying to me? Give me a psychology role. And that is interesting we didn't put this in the show notes, but I'm kind of wondering, would you, would you as a keeper, Seth, would you assess the target's appearance and maybe modify the investigator, assuming the investigator is talking to an NPC mm -hmm. and the NPC, let's assume in the example, the NPC is lying. But the investigator is not sure. Would you, you know, the investigator says, I want to roll psychology to see, is that person lying? It, would this be a, a scenario where you might uh, check the NPC's appearance and have that possibly apply bonus dice, penalty dice, or would the NPC's appearance maybe uh, adjudicate the required level of success. What about that? It depends. If I took the NPC, if I, if I actually made a roll for uh, the NPC and they're so attractive, they would get a plus in charm or fast stock or something, then I've already done that part. But if, if I'm not, if I actually didn't, if I'm just role playing and I say, they say this is like, I'm going to roll psychology to see if they're lying. And I actually never made a roll. I just announced they lied. Um, I might just increase the difficulty on that because you you're the character is kind of fighting that natural inclination uh, that we have to uh, instinctively trust the very pretty or distrust the the very ugly. Yep. Uh, another yep. way you could use psychology, and man, we are already going way off the show notes here. Is awesome. <laughs> if uh, when it comes to interpersonal, which is somehow what this whole topic has become, is if you roll a psychology on somebody when you when you meet them, or if you kind of observe them, you can determine what skill would be the best one to use on them. Uh, I, I would give a player that if, but like if they are watching the NPC and they did a psychology, I say it's like charm would work best on them, or I might give them a bonus die on charm because they have actually read the person beforehand. Uh, psychology like that is a great idea. I love that idea. 
because you know persuade is kind of your salesman right you're trying to persuade them into making the purchase on the on the timeshare or car or whatever uh and and a lot of sales is a lot of reading body language and kind of knowing this person will react to the, the hard sell this person to the soft this person wants to uh be complimented the whole time this person just wants to cut straight to the chase and and you get the sales pitch and get out of here uh, so psychology is something that I would consider very useful if the player ha showed that initiative to try to read them before they started. Now, the flip side is if they uh, fumble the psychology role, uh, you know, if they fail, it's like, ah, you don't really get it. But if they fumble, it's like, oh, yeah, this is about to be bad. And so that could be a penalty. <laughs> or I might tell them the wrong way to approach it. You know, it's like. Yeah, this bouncer, I think the only way you can get past this bouncer is if you get right in his face. That'll work. <laughs> get him to cower down. Exactly. That's it. Yeah. And then everybody else is looking at the PC going, I, I don't I don't think that I don't think that's right. It's like, now nah, watch this. I'm, I'm gonna get in his face. <laughs> yep. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh okay. So uh that's fantastic. I love actually really do love that conversation about uh uh the interpersonal skills like that. But I do want to move on because we do have some other uh, uh, ideas here. One is with the strength, right? So, you know, every time I think about a strength score, I always immediately leap back to uh, first edition D&D &D and Ben Barr's lift gates, right? Oh, and yeah. I feel like every time you're going to ask someone to make a strength roll, it's boiling down to Ben Barr's lift gate, right? But mm -hmm. uh, there is a skill on your character sheet called jump. And, you know, jump is something that uh, strong legs will help you do. And so I think it might be interesting. Um, you could use the, the strength score to kind of help gauge uh, distance for a character's uh, jump. And so you could take one fifth of your strength in feet with a running start and have that be the distance of a long jump. Um, okay. And I actually did, I was I was looking up. Which the, means on uh, average, that'd be 10 feet if they've got a strength of 50. Yep. So I'm like one of the least athletic people you'll ever meet. So is that <laughs> normal? It is. It is. I did. So I was like looking up uh, Olympic uh, long jump records. And of course, they measure those in meters. And so then I had to do the, the whole conversions and stuff. But I mean, in feet, these people are jumping just huge amounts in feet. And so for for uh, for in investigators, call Cthulhu investigators, even if you had like a 90 strength you're not jumping as far as an Olympic person in in meters. So I think it totally works. You could totally do measurement of your jump skill as one fifth of your strength score in feet, and it would totally be realistic. So the the, the current way that 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 it is calculated uh, in in Call of Duty, this is a rule I have never actually had to reference in a game. But uh, when you kind of pitched this idea to me, I looked it up because like, I don't even know what the distance is. It, it says it is, um, you can jump across or down equal to your character's height. And then with a running jump, it could be uh, twice your character's height. So if your character is, you know, six feet, you could either drop down or jump across six feet or get a running jump and get 12, which, uh, that I actually I'm, I'm not keen of because I know the character's size stat, but size could be broad or it could be height. You know, size can be defined several different ways. So, uh, very yeah, I don't think I have any of my characters actually wrote down how tall they are unless they're like really tall or really short. It's just kind of like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a big guy, but it's because I'm broad or you know maybe I'm I'm tall, but my since my size is kind of small, I'm actually really lanky. Um, so I'm not actually a big person. Um, however, um, one of the things that I thought of 
is so when you're you're calculating your your move uh for how fast your character just moves it's your strength plus your size um and for jump the base for that starts at 20 right so if you get a character sheet you're always going to have a 20 jump so what if it was one fifth basically that starting value that you rolled when you made the character of your strength plus one fifth of your size so if your average it averages 10 that would still equal 20. but if one or both of those is a little higher you could get more uh or it could take into account if you've got a, a high strength but a low size meaning you probably got little bitty legs uh <laughs> So, but it also takes into account your move, which I think that's kind of handy because um, if you're doing a running jump, you're you're obviously going to be getting a, getting a bit of a, a head start on there. So that's what that was. That's kind of my idea: is just one fifth your strength plus one fifth your size is your starting percentage. I love that. I think that's a fantastic. And again, I think that still um, is true to the uh, to the mechanics as they've been designed for seventh edition. I don't feel like we're really breaking anything uh, outside the outside the realm of what the mechanics already are. That's a great idea. Have that as your base percentage, and then I, I like the idea of of measuring the distance as one fifth of your strength because, as you said, nowhere in character creation do you note your character's height. You, you do size and, and and it could be anything. It could be tall and broad shouldered or short and portly. And that could be the exact same uh, size value. It just depends on how the players want to interpret it. Nobody yeah. is writing down that I'm five foot four or six foot two. I mean, nobody's writing that down. No. Yeah. So the the other one that I, I was I was thinking on this one is so we we know what a character's uh, uh, build is. You know, you've got like the build zero or you got the one or two and you get the damage bonus uh, on that, which that's um, uh, strength and size come into account. So what if your build number one or two, which is the, the human maximum, unless mythos or something crazy gets involved, is the number of bonus die you receive on um, a jump or possibly a climb check. So if you've got a build one, I got one bonus dice on those two skills. Um, now it's uh, by that formula, it's you know not going to be given too many penalty die. I guess you can have a build minus one. Never mind. Or if you have a build two because you're just jacked in both of them, you could have two bonus dice where we'd still keep the same, uh, I guess, base foundation. Uh, personally, though. I like the idea of you just set the base number and then you never have to think about the bonus dice situation again. But it kind of crossed my mind as a different way you could do it uh, to where the the size and strength is bonus, or it could just be your starting points um, and then just kind of leave it at that. Yeah, the I think the bonus would be, for me, it'd be situational. I think it would all depend upon what's going on on whether or not I might apply a, a bonus die, but it's it's an interesting thought. But I do, I love the idea of uh, altering the base percentage to a fifth of your strength plus a fifth of your size. And then, uh, and then just because your one fifth value is already posted on the character sheet, right up there at the top of your character sheet, that's a nice, quick, and easy way to go, oh, how far of a distance can I jump? There's the number right there, you know, yeah. instead of doing any additional uh, calculations for, <laughs> for a value that's not even that's not even uh, uh, recorded on your character sheet, you know? So. Yeah. But I, I think that yeah, I like to have that math there because I also don't want in the middle of a situation where we're trying to do it. And the player is now kind of debating exactly how tall they are. Uh, it's like, uh, I, was like I don't want to, I don't want to stop the game to think about this. Uh, it's just, am I this tall barefoot or am I this tall with shoes? My, my character has high heels on. Can I get that extra, you know, inch and a half or two inches? I've got four inch platform shoes on. We're playing in the seventies, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. That is awesome. Uh, so another one uh, that uh, that we've thought about 
is um, the the holding of of a character's breath. You know the that and that kind of ties in with the drowning rules, and that really kind of ties into your con. And this is this is not quite with a, a skill per se, right? We don't have a a hold breath skill, and and drowning isn't uh, adjudicated by a skill per se. Maybe other than you failed a swim roll or, uh, but you know, we use the drowning, even if it's a gas related, right? If you're in a, in a room that's being pumped full of a toxic gas, right? It's still the same kind of rules. Um, and so, you know, right now, I believe the, uh, the rule is just make con rolls until you fail. And then when you fail, you start taking damage, and there's no there's no way to go back to a holding breath state after you failed that con roll. Yeah, unless you get to a situation where you can breathe. Yeah, until until you can like reset again, and then and then you know, you know get your breath again. But I like uh, what we've kind of come up here, which is uh, an investigator could hold their breath for con times one in seconds without a penalty so if you've got a con of 50 you can hold your breath for 50 seconds right no problem and then you start applying a penalty die one penalty die for each iteration of the con in seconds so con times two would be one penalty die Con times three would be two penalty dice and so on because it becomes more difficult to hold your breath the longer you're doing it. I, I do like the idea of the escalation of uh, you know, every time you make that con because more time has, has passed, it gets harder. But uh, now I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily do con times one. 50 seconds would be your average. And it's like, Okay, that's really a short time to start uh, drowning. You know, if you know, I can, I can, I can hold my breath longer than fifty seconds and and not be pounding the table, uh, wishing for it to end yet. Uh, so I might start at con times two. So at that point, you're a minute and a half. Okay, you know, now we might need to start that, but yeah, something where because right now it's based off of rounds and rounds are never defined uh time wise they intentionally didn't do that it's kind of squishy as it's just long enough to do the thing and normally in games when people ask i say it's somewhere between six to ten seconds on average if if i have to give it a time it is in that realm of just a few seconds well by that definition if if a character was to be swimming and uh and then start drowning after six seconds uh, yeah i'm not going to give them damage because they they failed a swim check or something and it's only been six seconds that they've had their head underwater so i do like the idea of it being that one actually being something is it takes some time before you have to start making con checks for drowning or asphyxiation uh, so i'd probably start though at two times con and then probably every time you double that add a penalty die um and then once you got your two penalty die, then it's a hard and then it's extreme uh, because eventually your character should start blacking out because at that point you're several minutes in. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's not a situation that comes up that often. Um, so I think it would be something that uh, people would keep, even keepers would be looking up, you know, drowning or asphyxiation uh, on the fly if the situation comes up. But I think I have actually ever used that twice as far as the drowning rules. I, and, and that's being generous that I, I may have used that twice. Yeah, it's, it's nice in the book when I needed it, but it's, it's nothing that I've actually ever really fully committed to memory. I just, what I remember is where to find it in the book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thankfully it's noted in the, in the index. Oh, got to go here to look for that, uh, that rule. Yeah, I, I've uh, written one thing that by design was intending to possibly trigger a drowning uh, situation. So it was it's kind of a, a, a mechanic I was using to get the people through that underwater portion 
because if you dally, you will start incurring this drowning thing. And now in the notes, I'm like, keepers, look up the drowning here at this, uh, this rule and, 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 you know, apply this to this situation. If, if your characters are not quick. If you, if you're prepping your adventure and you know, you've got that alien force scene where they have to like dive down and swim some incredible distance to get out of here. Uh, then yeah, I would definitely prep that beforehand <laughs> as far as like, how, how does the drowning work rules work again? Because I, I'm, I'm pretty certain that's going to come up, but yeah, I said the times that I've ever had to look it up or even used it so rare, because even if I uh, did have that scene, that would be the time that nobody fails it. And <laughs> yeah, they all make their swims or, or whatever. And they're, they're done. You know, honestly, I, I thought about, are there other skills that we could be applying characteristics to and because I didn't want to overload the character sheet, I mean, the I think the skill-based system, the way it's already engineered, does such a great job for the vast majority of what it does. I, I really, other than the list that we came up with already, I don't know if there's anything else that I would really try to alter with no, the that, characteristics. I have I kind of come to realize over the years of when with contemporary uh, RPGs, I don't really feel the need that I have to house rule to fix anything, because I said these are just things I think it might be fun, but they're not anything that I feel like I'm actually fixing. I, I feel like I'm just kind of tooling around to kind of tool around with it. Yeah, uh, you know, back when I came from like old first edition AD and D, we did a lot of house rules just to fix stuff or when i was playing you know old cyberpunk from 1989 there were house rules we had to do to fix things that were it kind of taking away from some of our enjoyment and so you kind of you house rule you tweak it in order to make this run smoother and keep going these are more like uh, i'm just i'm just messing with it versus i, I don't feel that like i said it's my, my only complaint is the stats don't uh really affect skills after you do the initial skill thing of uh, how many skill points you get, but it's not bad enough that I would ever consider it like broken, but yeah, but I think that might be kind of fun to try out and see how they work because they might not. It, it, yeah. And for anyone who is interested in this, all of the adjustments and, and ideas that we just talked about, they'll be in the show notes. Uh, so you can take a look at the show notes uh, download them or, or copy them from our from our show and uh, apply them to your own game if you so and, desire. And also, like, hit us on Discord or something if you try them, if they work or don't. Like, I would actually like to know how how uh, how those worked uh, for people because if you've used them, they don't. I want to know, or if they used them and they work great, yeah, I definitely want to know. But uh, but yeah, that, I think that'd be kind of fun just to get like occasionally get a message on Discord if like we used it and this was the result of us trying that thing that you two just BS'd about nine months ago or a year ago or however long ago the episode uh, was for you. Exactly. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Please hit us up on Discord. Now, the, the next topic that uh, we want to talk about is investigator organizations, which you know are ways we can link the characters uh, together. Like you all belong to uh, this club. Or, or something like that. Uh, that way you can have characters that do have the very different backgrounds or very different credit ratings, or you know, very, they're very, they're just varied characters. As sometimes if you, if a keeper just looks at their group or if a GM of any game looks at their group and is like, okay, hey, everybody make me a character. And they all present this wild assortment of characters. Like um, I, one of the examples I've given before is you've got a, a hobo, a scuba diver, and, 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 a, and a rich doctor. And you're like, why in the hell are these three ever in the same room? And uh, you, can, you, you can link the backstories of like, well, we weren't always a hobo, a doctor, and a diver. But the other way of doing it would be an investigator organization where you all have this one common uh, social group or business or something that does uh, link you. So even though your educations or your backgrounds and social levels are vastly different, there's a really good reason why you two would be connected. And, and it kind of takes a lot of the, the struggle out for a lot of keepers once, you know, the, advent the adventure's done and it's like, okay, well, um, 
I don't know idea how we're going to get you together a second time. You know, we, we, we did the, you know, the one trick of the common friend brought you together for the first one and you solved the haunted house in the, in the Corbett house. And then we're going to do this other adventure. Like, okay, how the hell do I get my hobo back together with my diver and my doctor and, uh, you know, my, my trapeze artist that's in the circus. <laughs> so I, I love the idea of investigator organizations because those are cool. I also like secret societies. I've got an absolute, like, love of anything that's got a secret society like it gives it a plus in my in my book of like hell yeah so i want to talk about those and just different ones we've done and different ways that we've used them and different ideas there for uh for anyone out there i love it i love it so let me ask you ha have you used have you created any uh uh societies in your games um in in my Big campaigns uh, that I've done, yes. Um, in our uh, my my not Call of Cthulhu, Call of Cthulhu, I've talked about where you did Cyberpunk for it years ago. Um, how I did that is it was a, a supernatural club called the Arcanum Club that was in a, a coffee bar. So you had this coffee bar that had a mystic and magic and supernatural theme. So because uh, it was during Prohibition, it wasn't a normal bar. And so you go in and there was like you know, some of Houdini's shackles that he escaped from that are like on the wall behind the bar. And there's photographs of different mediums or, you know, different occult sort of themes to this place. And it was in Boston. So it was near Harvard. So you had a bunch of college kids kind of show up and they're trying to learn palmistry and, and that sort of thing. But then there was a second level to it. And everybody knew about the second level, but you didn't, nobody really knew how to get like, into it or what they did. And for the second level of the Arcanum Club, the inner circle, you had to provide some sort of proof of an encounter with the supernatural. Uh, and, uh, I used the haunting as mine. So my group actually used to go on every adventure with like three cameras because they wanted to get a photograph of the thing in, in order to like get credit, you know, picture it didn't happen. And so once they had their first adventure and they could have a verifiable uh, instance with the supernatural, that's when they got into the inner circle that did have people that had some low mythos or some of the really cool connections that they could make through that. And it ended up being a really good thing because, you know, when you have a character die, you could just literally bring them in through the group uh, as far as that. Or if they needed some help on something, they would then go to an NPC that's in the club, some sort of connection that happens to, you know, be able to read you know, ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics, and they could help them out. So it's a cool source of, you know, resources and bringing in other characters as a, just a theme we could do. So no matter what their education or social level was, they all just belong to this club. That's fantastic. Yeah. And, and that is really at the heart of why these groups work best is replacement characters. And having some, having a, a, a resource, you know, a, a pool of people who are experts in in different um, fields that that may not be in your party of, of investigators. I was going to say a previous podcast that I was on, the Misconic University podcast. It was founded by Dan Kramer, and Dan had a fantastic group that I just, I loved this idea. It was called the Miskatonic Area Paranormal Society, or MAPS for short. And he totally blatantly ripped that off from that TV show, Ghost Hunters, that had, for theirs, it was the, the Atlantic Paranormal Society, or TAPS for short. So he said, oh, instead of TAPS, it'll be BAPS. And it's the Miskatonic that, area. Hey, it works. So, it does. It totally works. And it was so great. You know, we would uh, we were playing games and, and all of our characters were members of MAPS. So, you know, if somebody died, it was another MAP member that came in and, and backfilled. Now, one thing when you when we're you do it and you've got uh, as a source of new PCs, uh, that I think is kind of important is you never specify exactly who all the members are. Yeah, you know, it's kind of like, you know, how many how many members are there? It's like, oh, there's like thirty to forty, and you know, and the, and the player characters uh, or the players might have certain specific NPCs that they have connections to, but there's still kind of this weird nebulous, 
you know, other faceless members in the group. That way, you know, one of them suddenly you know, pulls back the hood and they're the new PC and they join the group and they go along. Versus if you say there are 20 members of the group and these are their names and these are all their information, it's actually kind of harder to then bring in a new PC because uh, I like that kind of nebulous, you know who these 15 are, but there's 15 more that are kind of vaguely uh, defined. Uh, they're there. And if we need to have a new NPC or a new PC, we we will have them step from the mist and get definition. But until then, they're just kind of in the room, uh, kind of background characters. Uh, one of the things that got me thinking about this is I was recently uh, reading the very classic uh, Shadows of Yogg-Sothoth adventure. And in in that, you're, it basically starts with your characters joining the Order of the Silver Twilight. And I uh, I, I was reading this as I was like, man, what I love about this is, you know, depending on how the adventure goes, um, the Order of the Silver Twilight, spoilers, is a cult. <laughs> so it's like you accidentally join a cult, you know, like you do. Uh, you know, some, sometimes you end up selling Amway. Sometimes you summon Yogg's to Thoth. You know, cults, they go, they vary. But... I, I like the idea of your your society, your investigative organization, are kind of the the former members, and and what has bonded them was these are people that kind of got tricked into this. So your investigator organization is all of the kind of nameless former members that once the Silver Twilight goes through its thing, kind of step up and like, oh man, hey, I remember you from back in the day. That was crazy. And uh, sure, I'll join your party or sure, I can give you some some help based off of whatever my specialty is. Uh, so I kind of like that it's almost like the survivors group as your your shared um, interest that you get into. And maybe they could form a, a, a new uh, lodge of some sort to fight that. But I kind of like the idea of, you know, that that's your investigator organization is starts as the evil enterprise and then becomes the reformed <laughs> or you know the survivors of, <laughs> uh, of that so i think that that, that was you know, whole time i was reading I was like, that would that would be fun and i think in the updated version because when they i was reading the uh the reprints of the old second edition version and uh then i i had a copy of it in um the one that they revised and kind of expanded a few years ago i had that in pdf and i just never read it mm -hmm. i just acquire stuff and I kind of like, oh, let me read that. And I think they actually added that as a, kind of a, a keeper kit tip. It was like, you know, they could make new PCs out of this organization. I was like, ah, dang it. I thought I was original for thinking of that on my own. But I, I kind of like that. I don't know. I just think that's a fun way of doing it of if in a, an early adventure for the player characters, even if it's that or something else, if there is the cult or the organization that they bring down because people are getting fooled, you know, it's a common theme you have in a lot of adventures that those people from their very first adventure kind of become that NPC organization. And uh, I think that'd be kind of cool. Another one that you could do in modern day games is it could be a digital group, such as uh, a Reddit group. So, you know, you're, or, or some, uh, message board where people go on and they talk about uh, the supernatural or you know these these strange uh, happenings, and and like with a lot of online communities, you know half the members are are kind of like lurkers or you know they might say something every once in a while and then you've got that core group of people that are just really active and they're talking on everything and you know they're interacting with people, and then there's that nebulous usernames. They've been there for a while. They got vetted in whatever ways, if you have to actually get vetted to get a, a login to join this website or whatever. You don't necessarily even know what these people's names are, or they could be from around the world. And if you do have that for a modern game, where you have an online community, and then you lose one, that's when you have one of those characters start becoming more active, because that becomes your new PC that kind of emerges uh, from the shadows of the internet, it kind of becomes the active member of your party. So I think that'd be kind of a cool way of doing it. That way it, does, it doesn't have to be a spooky lodge or you know Freemason hall. It could just be a, a website that is your organization. Oh, absolutely. I, I love that idea, you know, because 
there are there are so many different ways to connect with people online in a in a modern setting it could you know as you said reddit and it could be facebook or it could be discord or it could be some kind of dating app right i mean these could all be you know people from uh you know, plenty of fish or whatever, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> plenty, plenty of fish is what the deep ones use to... to, to <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's where they're trying to find their victims. But, you know, the, the, the interesting thing is that, um, you know, in the in the relatively short period of time of, uh, of the World Wide Web, we've already had instances of these online communities that have... That have been uh, gone defunct. They've shut down, like BBS systems, right? We nobody uses bulletin board systems anymore, or uh, G plus, which was very popular when it was up and going, and then you know, I guess because Google decided that it wasn't earning them money, they were like, eh, let's just shut it down, or they sold that division of business, and they decided to shut down. People were were not totally up in arms, but people were vocal and, and despondent that, that G plus was going away. I mean, you could, I mean, not only are those types of online archived information great for trying to go for clue investigations, but you know, you could have characters who are tied together uh, because they were, BBS friends then became Facebook friends and then became G plus friends. And, and it's so interesting, you know, uh, kind of characterized in, in the movie ready player one, you don't even know what these people look like in real life. You know, they, these are handles and things like that. They, you don't know their real uh, gender or, or, or what they're, uh, what they look like until you actually make that real life connection. I kind of like that, that idea of it's, it's this organization that's been around since like the nineties and as whatever platform they're using kind of goes away, they just kind of migrate. And so you could have it to where your, your character when they start has, has honestly been on, on this board since they were a teenager and then their, their life took off. They got this occupation. They did this. They, you know, they all kind of went all these different directions, but they're still active on the sport. So that's how you've got your uh, Olympic gymnast and your hobo and your doctor and your deep sea diver is because back when they were, you know, 16 years old, they were on some early message board uh, on, on some now defunct platform and that it's just kind of migrated around and and they've only known each other as usernames or you know they might have met once or twice of like oh you're you're in seattle i'll be in seattle next week we should possibly meet each other for the first time and then that becomes your core group of adventurers so you know when a new character comes in it could either be they're a new member that joined this message board or they're an older member maybe one that wasn't active for a long time you know, starts posting. It's this big deal because this username pops up and like, wow, that, that hasn't been used in years. And, you know, this person shows up and they might have the hook that gets everybody involved in the next adventure. And they came back to the old boards. Uh, so I think that, I think that's kind of fun. I like that idea. That is cool. And, you know, if, I mean, if people, if players are looking for, uh, if they like the idea of an investigative organization, but you're just not sure, you know, how to create one or something like that, the investigator handbook has a slew. And while I'm not going to, you know, drain the slide and go through each and every one of them, it's interesting that these groups can be centered around a variety of shared experiences. Really. I feel like the, uh, the core, element to any one of these groups is there's some kind of shared uh, interest or shared experience that is what ties people together. Maybe you're all, uh, the investigators are all members of a circus troupe. Uh, and so you could be part of that, or you all work for the same newspaper, uh, or you're all part of the same income level, right? You're all these wealthy philanthropists, you know, who are kind of uh, together. And this is, you know, you know, for a lot of this, I'm thinking 1920s. Uh, but as we were saying, for modern, you could all be members of the same uh, uh, 
dating app or, well, or, or there was, there's right? one that's in there and uh it's the 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 wiper pals which was uh basically i think it was like a like a squad in the first world war or or some mm -hmm. a unit that had quite a bit of members something weird happened in the in the trenches of europe and after the war ended they they all had this this common thing and so a, a war experience could work as your society in any timeline that you wanted. I mean, if you, if you wanted to do it modern, we served in, in Iraq together. If you wanted to do it, you know, in the, in the 1960s, we served in Korea together, Vietnam, or if we're older in the Second World War, uh, Invictus, we went to, you know, you know, we, we were we were conquering North Africa together and we had this shared experience. And even though we have all moved on with our lives and we're no longer soldiers, we do keep in touch due to this. And that's when you kind of form your your society is from the shared war experience. And and I, I, I think that's probably one of the most uh, easy to adapt ones of your characters uh, were in a war together as your shared backstory, because that way later on, it doesn't matter what your uh, different professions or social and credit levels are because you are, you are still serving together for this event. Uh, so and also, if it's like an entire unit of, of soldiers or something, it still is big enough that you could have new ones appear as, as PCs because they were, they were always there. As long as you don't name every single member and you have that kind of half of them are sort of faceless thing that's uh that's very easy to do yep yep absolutely uh there are a lot of great investigate uh investigator organizations out there honestly my favorite uh organization is one that was published in a in a supplement back in 86 called terror from the stars and this book uh, which unfortunately is not available uh, digitally from uh, Drive Through RPG or digitally from uh, direct from Chaosium, uh, but this book in the center it had a twelve-page supplement right in the center. It was designed to be removed, and so sometimes if you're buying Terror from the Stars, like uh, on a secondhand market you might be getting a copy that had the the field manual for the Theron Mark Society. You might have it removed. So hopefully you can get one of these um, uh, in, on the secondary market with it still fully intact. But it's neat because, you know, for everything else that's been published recently, you know, with the investigator handbook and the, I don't know, there's a lot, like 10 or 12 uh, uh organizations in it you're getting a few paragraphs uh and in anything else that i've ever seen you're getting a few paragraphs but with this this booklet that was in terror from the stars this was a 12 page and they designed it to look like a field manual it was it it's so funny because uh of course it's all fictitious so they have this character uh named andre stalin who is supposedly the author of this field manual. And when you see it, you know, it's got the, the typed print, you know, throughout the 12 pages, but apparently uh, Andre has gone back into this and has handwritten notes in the margins of this thing, or he circled certain words in this manual and made certain notes like, oh, that was a bad day, you know, that kind of thing, you know, when someone, you know, tied the 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 flashlight to the shotgun, you know, as a, as a as a tip and a trick for going into dark places with the shotgun, tie the flashlight, you know, to the barrel. Of course, it's only going to be good for one shot, you know, because as soon as that thing bucks, it's going to shatter, you know, your uh, your oh, yeah, flashlight. Nineteen twenties bulbs, I think they. they they broke it. You looked at them wrong. <laughs> so, but it is such an interesting uh, handout because you know it's it's this twelve page booklet and it it just gives all kinds of inf interesting information and it's so funny. So the 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 fictitious author Andre, you know, he's got all these different categories in there. He talks about 
you know, uh, as members of this uh, Theron Marx Society, you know, here are the strategies uh, for investigation that they've kind of put together. You know, the the different personnel that are in this group, you know, the officers and stuff, the types of equipment that you take in the field, you know, investigative procedures, how to how to have coded communications with other members so you can have conversations better that are in code you know different tactical procedures that's the section that has the flight there's even a drawing a flashlight tied to a uh, to a shotgun and then uh, and i love this chapter you know the right weapon for the right monster right you know it, which really boils down to right tool for right job right um so it's so interesting to see this really all spelled out in the in the field manual for the theron mark society and i would love to see this book you know reissued from chaosium or at the very least pull it out and have the field manual of the theron mark society available as a 12 page pdf right i mean this would just be That's, awesome that, i like that that sounds that sounds really cool yeah you're, you're kind of mentioning that the notes that are off to the side like these kind of personal anecdotes um back in you know, second edition DD, one of my favorite books that they released uh was called the arms and equipment guide uh it was one of the ones i just loved reading and what I loved about it is next to certain weapons, they would have these just things like it was written by, you know, so-and-so, whatever thief talking about the whip or whatever type of weapon or piece of equipment it was. And sometimes it was good. Sometimes it was bad. Sometimes it was just kind of funny. These just kind of odd little comments uh, about, you know, something that you could do with a halberd or something something really stupid that one of their party members did with a halberd once and you definitely shouldn't do this sort of little note to the side that was, that was like my favorite little detail because it, it kind of added this human element instead of just reading about the the equipment that was in there you got to have these little kind of snippets of the lives of an adventurer so when you mention that as far as like oh that was a bad day it's like okay it's like a little snippet of the life of, a, of an you know an investigator uh, of this society coming back going yeah definitely don't do that i don't know what i don't know why they they suggested that that was a terrible idea or you know oh that worked like a dream you know <laughs> it's like i'm gonna underline that twice <laughs> I love it. Yeah. This, this field manual for the Theramark Society is so, so interesting. I just, I love the way it's put together. It's very, uh, it's very meta, you know, because it's, it's, it's written from the perspective as if it was real. And it's just so interesting. It makes for a great handout. You could give the whole book to a group of players and say, you found this and, and you, you might think about, you know, maybe they're not members of the Theramark Society, but you say, hey, you found this and maybe you, you know, adopt some of the principles that are in this for your own society. Oh, I like that where they're not members, but, you know, they they stumbled across a pamphlet. Uh, that, that A waterlogged, filthy copy that was left in the back of some, you know, uh, burnt out uh, uh, file yeah, cabinet. The, the, the attic trunk, you know, that y you get somewhere or something like that. That's, that's cool. Of you know, And that kind of propels you into it. Or you can say like our shared backstories. We were kids. We found this. And now that our, our characters are adults, and we are, you know, still the, the junior third Mark society, even though we're, you know, full grown adults now. But, you know, we're still the, you know, <laughs> the junior division are, are now going to have our first adventure. Yep. Uh, that, that sounds, that sounds fun. I like that. Uh, I also like the idea of them because let's see, I love secret societies. That's, that's one of those things like in, you know, in a movie, if you throw a secret society in there, I'm always like, yeah, is like the, the, the secret handshake or the symbol or the, the uh, mark on a building to tell you like where the safe place to go is or where the, the meeting hall is that if you're in the know, you know how to find it. Uh, th those sort of things. Cause yeah, you know, I also like the idea of, you know, if your characters are uh, living in New York and then you go to Berlin, that somewhere on their adventure, they might notice this mark and they know that you know, at, at least at some point, maybe it's still active, there was a, a thing here. So they can kind of go and check that out. And then they've kind of got a local chapter that they can 
joint or they get to the local chapter that was burnt down and then they find out it was burnt down like years ago or like weeks ago that you know maybe there's some threat around and, and i like that i like the idea of the investigator organizations having kind of a broad reach versus just a a, a little club it could just be a, a a very large organization or a very small organization that's spread out very wide and that could be a cool little uh, thing you could have. And also, if you are going to have a globe hopping campaign, uh, have it to where there's all of a sudden there's a chapter in all the major cities so they can, you know, contact them or have some additional support or resources or something like that. Maybe there's a safe house, but who knows how safe it is. Well, I say, yeah, you don't know how old it is, or, you know, maybe the, the, the local chapter has gotten, uh, you know, something is now influencing them and they're, you know, working against the rest of the organization now. And of course, an, another classic one uh, would be Delta Green, which was kind of the, the government secret society X-Files uh, sort of organization, which you know, was either you're working for this sort of like FBI X-Files thing, but sometimes they could just be a postman is a member of Delta Green, and then they got activated by their handler and whatnot. And I always really liked that uh, idea of this is a, a agency or some sort of shadow uh, government thing going on, or maybe stretches internationally. Uh, just because for some reason, I love the idea of like, you know, the, the, the kind of your standard, uh, you know, homemaker housewife with that that donna reed hair getting the phone call and that weird <laughs> muffled voice is the code word and yeah you know, she like you know stops vacuuming the floor it like opens up the floor panel and you know pulls out a couple mac tins and just <laughs> goes to work and it's like well this is how my character is activated <laughs> yep yep Opens up the uh, the vacuum to pull out the hidden uh, piece that's in there. Yeah, you know, you know. three passports from different countries. You know, uh, a, a stack of bills of different you know types. And it just goes, and and then your player has to like occasionally like go through like, oh, you know, calling your husband's like, oh yeah, my aunt's still sick. I'll I'll be I'll be back soon, dear. You know, I left you know food in the fridge for you, and then you know she goes back to you know hunting ghouls through the sewers of Chicago or something. That's awesome. Yeah. Investigator organizations are fantastic. And, you know, if you're going to have a campaign, it's almost like it's a must. Oh yeah. I, I just, I like the idea of the, the, the club. Uh, it's, it, it's just fun to me. And now one thing I, I will suggest that I have learned, if you are going to, uh, have create one for your campaign. If you're not going to use any of the, the existing ones out there, you might kind of get some ideas and make up your own. Uh, don't do all of it. Actually sit down with your players and have your players help you, uh, such as, okay, hey, you guys have a motto. What's your motto? You know, you guys have a, a, a symbol. What's your symbol look like? Uh, maybe they could name it. And the reason for that is even if you start the campaign where they're not members of this, uh, such as the one I did where their first adventure was they were trying to earn their way into it. They were aware of it. They had an ownership of it. The players around the table felt an ownership of this group because they came up with certain details about it. And that, that's, a, that's a really cool thing you can do because one, it takes a lot of the legwork uh, off you know that they're going to like whatever it is because they came up with it and they're going to feel more kind of protective of it because now it's theirs. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I never did that with any of our organizations, but I have done that when uh, in, in a different game years ago where it was a gang they all belonged to. And then another one that I did at D&D where it was a, uh, a pirate ship they all belonged to. It was like, what's the name of your pirate ship? But different things like that. And then we started it and they were like the first level peons. And the campaign was about working their way up, but they still felt this connection because they named the ship. They named, you know, they designed what their flag looked like. And so I just kind of suggest if you're going to write your own, don't, don't write it all. Let your players come up with a lot of that and tell you what it is. Let them discuss it because 
whatever you come up with, they might love, but they're more likely to absolutely love and, and, and fiercely protect it if you let them fill in some of those details for you. I love that idea. You know, the um, kind of stealing from another game, uh, Blades in the Dark, uh, in which you play as a, uh, a gang of thieves, and it could be a variety of types of thieves, maybe your cut purses or uh, your, your uh, assassins. I mean, it could, you know, whatever your group is made up of, you also create your... Uh, your den, you know, so where is it that you uh, hide out and and do your plots and schemes um, and and what kind of uh, what kind of things can your club do, right? Does does your group do? You can apply that as well to Call of Cthulhu, where maybe the keeper puts a list together of like ten. 10 features uh, or aspects that your club potentially could have, you know, like for say example, does your, does your headquarters, assuming you have a headquarters, maybe, and maybe that's one of the questions is, do you have a, a, a unified headquarters or is it decentralized? You know, do you sometimes meet at Pete's house and then sometimes at Mary's house or, you know, is it, is it, you know, decentralized like that, or do you have a certain building and then what are some of the features and just kind of give a list and then, provide that list to the players and say, okay, here's a list of 10 features that your, that your headquarters potentially could have, you know, pick four yeah, yeah. and then have them go, okay, well, we think this is important. Let's have this, let's have this and this. And then that means there's certain things that they don't have, right? You, you know, they're picking and choosing what they want to feature versus what they won't having access to yeah. and if, if they choose it that also means that's now important to the player so you know what to focus on um because yeah i love the idea of like do you meet every tuesday or do you you know is there some sort of thing that tells you there's a meeting like you know the 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 flower pot in the window has been moved to the left side versus the right that means there's a meeting you know tonight or you know there's a, a drop a dead drop location that, you know, those, and there's a, a note in there. It tells you it's, you know, we're doing a meeting and this is where the meeting is because we don't have a headquarters. Um, or it could just be, you know, we, we meet at the Denny's and yeah, we just go to the, go to the back corner and, and have our whispered conversation yep. or, or whatnot. So uh, but I, just, I like to give them some ownership. It, the, the results are, are fantastic uh, because they feel protective of it. And now they definitely, they're definitely invested. It, you didn't have to come up with it and one kind of hope that they liked it or hope that they remember it. If they came up with it, they're much more likely to remember some of those details because they came up with it and they feel clever. They love that aspect about it. And I, I like that because I want them to feel like the organization is theirs, even if they're starting off at the lowest ranks of it. I agree. That's awesome. Uh, if any of the listeners are in your campaigns, if you're putting together organizations, again, please come to our Discord and and tell us about it. Uh, share any information that you can. Uh, maybe it's something that other groups can pick up and they can adopt to their games as well. This was fun. I enjoyed this one. I, 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 I love the part where we got completely derailed and just started talking about interpersonal skills. That's, that's my favorite thing. Uh, since you and I get so chatty that, uh, <laughs> that's yes, that that's easy for us. That's I why think. every 30 minute, like phone call we have goes for two hours. <laughs> indeed. Indeed. We have a Patreon and I would love to, uh, send a quick shout out to our recent uh, patrons who have joined us. Uh, so I want to say thank you to uh, Thomas Thetford. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you. And uh, thank you to Rom Elwell for also joining. Absolutely. Uh, Pete Burgess. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Seth Wilson. Thank you for joining. And Tyler Carty. Thank you so much for your support. This show is, cannot be made without your generous support. So thank you all Definitely. so much. 
And like we mentioned before, uh, a couple of times, we do have a Discord uh, where uh, we will chat. There's a lot of other little conversations that happen, uh, which once again, if you try any of just the, the harebrained stuff that, that we, we ramble about wondering how it work, if you would like to give us an after action report of if it worked great or if it fell on its face, uh, you can contact us there, let us know cuss us out or, you know, maybe tell us thanks if it was a good one. And, <laughs> <we're> just, <laughs> uh, and sometimes a lot of people will show up and they will ask for uh, ideas for shows they might suggest to us or ask specific questions on anything that we might not have explained or just touched on. So uh, definitely show up, just give us a chat. Please do. And I got to give Seth a shout out. He works so hard. He knows the YouTube universe so well that Seth even formats this podcast, this audio podcast into a YouTube show. So there are uh, slide cards. There are secret little <laughs> blinks of the uh of our of our Cthulhu mascot. So uh, if you want to check us out on YouTube, please look us up. It's uh it's really great. It's super great. So thank you, Seth, for everything you do for the uh, well, YouTube show. Uh, YouTube's kind of my thing. Uh, UK Bit is the experienced podcaster, so I let you handle all that. But I, I, I at least I at least know how to navigate myself around uh, that platform. Uh, so. Um, Definitely, definitely check that out if uh, if you want to. I normally don't upload the videos until about two days after an episode does drop, so the the uh, there is a little bit of a delay before that because they take me a little bit of time to do. Uh, I think this last month I was out of town when the episode dropped, uh, so I didn't get it up on YouTube for like a week and a half or something later. Or so. It, that happens. They will all be there. They're just not going to be there as promptly as the regular podcast. And uh, just so our listeners know, um, one of the benefits of being a patron is uh, patrons are going to get early access to these shows. Uh, I am trying to uh, stick to a third Monday of the month of when the shows will go uh, full public. Uh, but for our patrons, as soon as we get these things edited, boom, I put it out for them, uh, PDQ, so they'll hopefully have a fortnight to listen to it before it uh, goes wide, uh, as well as I will always put uh, the RSS feed uh, in Facebook uh, if people just want to be able to grab the RSS feed and then listen to the show that way. So, Seth? You know, of course, as always, we cannot do this show alone. Uh, I want to thank our amazing editors, Max Mohaffa and Edwin Nagy, for their hard work and keen skills at making us sound Thanks, awesome. guys. Ed, once again, since we keep going off track and having moments of silence as we're trying to remember what certain things are called, you make us sound much more uh, competent. <laughs> Much more. We also really want to thank John Sumro for our, our badass logo. He's a very talented artist, so please follow him on Facebook. Check out his official website. Please consider joining his Patreon account. Uh, links in the show notes, as well as follow him on Twitter. So thank you very much, John. Thank you, John. Yeah, awesome, awesome, fantastic artist. Uh, and, gosh, we cannot uh, thank them enough. Darkest of the Hillside Thickets for generously allowing us to use their song Gluttony as our intro and outro music. If you are a fan of the Lovecraft's writing and the Call of Cthulhu RPG, you really need to check out the Darkest of the Hillside Thickets. They are an amazing band. Check out their band camp site. Check out their official band website. Those links will also be in the show notes. Thanks for listening. <laughs>